So our year will intentionally be built around us trying to express, trying to manifest um, these four words at the way. Jesus, justice, de churchify and belong. And we want to invite you to join us in this journey to live out this mission, this vision, this theme of what it means to follow the ways of Jesus faithfully, both in our personal, family, communal lives, living out justice, a love that is concrete in public spaces, what it means to take seriously that discipleship is real and that as we build community, there are some things that we can hold on to and there are some things that we can kind of wear a little loosely. I'm not saying that, you know, anyone has to throw away your expression of church that you just love and have been used to, but I am saying that sometimes your preference and my preference may not necessarily have to be the preference of everybody when it comes to how we live in Christian community. And our certain priority for sure is we want to cultivate a space where everybody is seen and belongs. And we invite you to help us live that out in 2024. Um, and so our scripture today is going to challenge us, hopefully, to think about that and to embrace that and to lean into that. Obviously, every first Sunday of the year, I'm sorry, of the month, we engage in consecration, sorry, communion. And so we are going to remember the sacrifice, the act of radical love that God has for the world, uh, embodied in Jesus the Christ dying on the cross for our sins and and we're going to uh, celebrate communion as we always do. I'm going to uh, abbreviate my message today, try to spread it across a couple of weeks uh, so we don't miss out on that, which I think will be powerful for us to think about. This scripture is a very, very uh, favorite passage of scripture for me. It is a part of our lectionary passage. Uh, this Sunday is a Sunday that is known as Epiphany Sunday. Uh, it is uh, the Sunday that... Uh, follows the immediate season of Christmas and uh, Advent and gives us as a church an opportunity to think deeply about what does it mean for us to see the Lord. Um, and so Isaiah chapter number 60 is where we'll spend our time. It should be up on the screen. Uh, and I invite you to read along with us or look it up on your phones or just close your eyes and listen to the words of scripture as they wash over us to prepare us for the preached word on today. Isaiah is the prophetic, uh, one of the major prophets in the Jewish scriptures, considered to be uh, one of the collection of, of individuals or a prophetic community that were seeking to help the children of Israel make sense of life coming out of exile. Always important to appreciate that there is indeed a context whereby the texts that we read are always written to a people who are enduring the hard boot of the state, of the empire, of human governments that are usually unable to fully reflect the original intent of creation. I always think it's important for us to remind ourselves that God creates everything in abundance, which means that there's enough for everybody. You ought to say that. Somebody just said, there's enough for everybody. There's enough food for everybody. There's enough land for everybody. There's enough water for everybody. There's enough for everybody. God didn't create, like, you know, the world to only hold 100,000 human beings, and all of a sudden, a million pop up. And then just throw us all in the ring to fight it out. 
<laughs> I mean, that, that's not a good design. That may be your design, my design. But creation was created with enough. And God at the beginning of creation looked at everything God created and said, that is good. The challenge comes when we who are created misplace our position in creation and believe that we are actually the ones who should have everything, which then creates scarcity. And so justice is the act of trying to reset human relationships so that everything that has been created in abundance can be shared among all that has been created. Mm -hmm. How many of you know that when there's not enough, when people are trapped in a scarcity mindset, they will do things to other people to try and get their needs met? And that's why folks be bipping. And that's why folk be robbing. And that's why folk be taking, busting out our windows. Somebody say, man. I mean, you can't even go nowhere. You got, you got to walk around. I was somewhere, and I, I, I had to put my backpack on. Walk around my backpack. I was just walking around like, Lord Jesus, these bippers. I can't even leave my stuff in my car. But then I, you know, always get arrested by my hopefully right analysis that the only reason there are bippers in the bay is because we live in the wealthiest part of the world and we got people sleeping outside. We got more empty houses than unhoused people in the Bay Area. Somebody say scarcity versus abundance. And so this is the backdrop that I always want us as a people to come to this text. We need the prophets, we need the text, we need the scriptures to keep challenging us to not buy in to the false narratives and lies that put us against one another when we are always better together. How many of you know in your relationships you are always better if you stick together? On your job, you are better together if you stick together. Well, if you got a good coworker, be <laughs> like, Pastor Mike, you don't know who I share this cubicle with. Somebody say, man, this, whew, I wish I had worked by myself. But you know that you cannot accomplish as much by yourself than you could with other people. And so this idea of the prophet reminding the children of Israel, listen, you all have been literally colonized. You've been dominated. You've been thrust in a foreign uh, society and you have forgotten the covenant ways. Now we got to get ourselves back rightly tuned to the ways of God and this passage is an invitation for all of us to think about how can we get back in the light as the passage says and so Isaiah 60 verse number one all right we're gonna read it it says like this arise shine for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you for darkness or I like to say gloom shall cover the earth and thick darkness or gloom covers the peoples. But the Lord will arise. Somebody say the Lord will arise upon you and the Lord's glory will appear over you. Amen. Nations shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Verse number four, so lift up your eyes and look around they, talking about the nations, will all gather together and come to you. Your sons shall come from far away. Your daughters shall be carried on their nurses' arms. Then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and rejoice because the abundance of the sea shall be brought to you and the wealth of the nations shall come to you. 
This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. We're going to speak on the topic today. We outside. Bow your hands with me and let's pray. God, we want to say thank you, Lord. Thank you for the word of God that is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Thank you for this gift of scripture and of community and of preaching and teaching. I pray that the anointing that makes all of this come together for both the hearer and the preacher will be made easy by your spirit. And we'll say thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. Give your neighbor a high five and tell them, we outside, we outside in 20... 24, we are outside. Now, epiphany is a word that obviously, uh, you know, if you have a nice GRE or you read a few uh, books, you know, epiphany is a word that speaks to just a revelation, a something that obviously appears. You ever heard somebody say, man, I need an epiphany? You ever say that? No, not really. How many know somebody named Epiphany? How about that? Probably so, right? Well, whoever named a child Epiphany, it wasn't just because it sounded cute or, you know, had a nice little ring to it. (laughs) The word exists in our English lexicon because it denotes this sense that there is information and knowledge that I am looking for to help illuminate a space in my life that lacks light. Now, it's really important to appreciate that sunlight that comes to us here on the earth literally is about, you know, it would take, I think, millions of years maybe to travel to the sun. I mean, it's far away. Like, Star Wars, it says, in a galaxy far, far away. But the sun is not as far away as that. But there is this sense that the earth is being illuminated by the radiation and the sunlight that comes to us. Most of us appreciate or understand or when we see the sun on our kids' uh, coloring books and pages, the sun is usually the color yellow. When I was reading about the sun, it said in the science article that the color of the sun is actually white. I sat there like, hmm, ain't that something? And that it literally appears to us through a whole very kind of complicated process, and I'm not going to spend too much time uh, going down the rabbit hole on because I'm going to abbreviate my sermon for today, but what I found most powerful about the sun and the light and the way it is mediated to us is that the radiation of the sun shows up in three primary ways, as light, as heat, and as energy. Light, that which illuminates. Heat, that which provides warmth. Energy, that which fuels us. Light, heat, energy is the concrete contribution among many things. Gravity also helps anchor the whole solar system revolving around the sun. But these concrete contributions are that which you and I depend on in order to have just a functional basis of life. Can you imagine what God is inviting us into when we read this passage And the words are telling us to arise, shine, for the light has come. To literally step out of the places where light is being blocked, 
Step out of the places where the warmth is unable to be extended. To seek places where the energy can literally be transferred. That light, that heat, and that energy are a direct result of us stepping into the sun. We are living in a moment and in a time and in a season where there are so many, particularly as we come into a new year, who are constantly trying to figure out how can I maximize this new season, this new year, often with a sense of what was, as we talked about last week, left undone, an aspiration that we did not necessarily reach, or just the hope that, man, I want my next year to be better than my last year. I want to submit to you this morning that part of what we are being invited to think about is how can we literally step outside of the places and spaces that keep us away from the light? How can we step outside of the places and the spaces that keep us from experiencing the warmth that we need, you need, in order to remain human in a cold world? How can we step outside of the places and the spaces that keep us from having access to the energy spiritually, emotionally, physically, that causes us to not fully realize the expectation for this new season, this new year. And this is an opportunity for you and I to ask ourselves some very serious questions about what is keeping me from being outside. How many of you know sometimes we be afraid to go outside? We get comfortable inside. It's not lost on me for the last few years, particularly during the pandemic when we were all sheltering in place. We could not go outside. At least we were told not to. Shelter in place. Develop your pod. Get your few people. Don't be out here mixing it up. And I just think it's worth saying that COVID and respiratory illnesses are on a huge uptick. And so... Keep testing yourself and protecting yourself. And that's why we have the windows open and we got the air circulating so nobody's germs stay in here too long. <laughs> Somebody say amen. We, we upgrade our circulation system so all the air we breathe is literally getting sucked into that vent right there. And it's getting pushed outside. And then new air is coming inside. Amen. But still, you know, don't be coughing on people and, you know, doing the most. <laughs> Somebody say amen. amen. Tell you never cooperate with us, amen, today. We, we trying to be healthy. But it is true that during COVID-19, and some would say before, isolation and loneliness has become a unique challenge for so many who lost the rhythm of getting outside. We found ourselves isolating, found ourselves inside. And we got comfortable. We can get comfortable being inside a place that is not big enough to hold you. Have you ever been? Lord, I don't want to mess with y'all because it's the first Sunday of the year. But have you ever been in a relationship that was too small to hold you? Have you ever been on a job? Man, I'm this job. I, 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 I got to go back to school because this job is too small for my aspirations. You ever been working with folk and they got a pea brain and you got... <laughs> and you know, you know it to be true. You'd be like, man, this is who they was talking about, you. And for many of us, we are cognizant that this place I'm in is not serving me well. But it's hard sometimes when you're used to being inside 
a small place rather than going outside to a place with a little bit more room. Part of what this opportunity affords you and I is to think about not necessarily what it means to just leave every situation that is difficult or hard, but what does it mean to take seriously that perhaps God is calling me to think about how can I exist in wherever I am, even when it seems like I'm in a place that's not comfortable, and still be outside? How can I live in uncomfortable places and spaces and not be confined to the limitation that that place or space is laying on me? How can I function in a cold environment and still access some heat? How can I be around a whole lot of lethargic people or bad energy and still be tapped in to the energy of the life-giving sun? I want you to know, beloved, that there is another kind of way to exist that is more than what you can see with your naked eye. That there are rules to life that go beyond our physical composition. There is a spiritual component to our lives and to our constitution. And the consecration that we're talking about is actually a formula that we are offering us to help cultivate that part of your life and your being that helps you literally to tap into the light even when you're in a dark place. To literally find warmth even when you feel like you're at the Arctic. And I'm telling you, it's been cold here in the Bay Area the last couple of days. I walked outside and didn't have my coat. I said, loose here, Satan. <laughs> I ain't trying to be in no Midwest, 40 degrees in the morning. What is that? Let's get back up there to the 50, 51. How many of you know sometimes God is inviting you and I to think deeply about how can I cultivate the energy that fuels me towards my purpose when I'm literally being grinded into dust. There's three things that I want to offer to you today that I think can be helpful for us, particularly in this text, is giving us a couple of important invitations. The first one you got to think about is 2024 must be a year regardless of where you are constituted in your journey, that you must make a decision to step into the light. Everybody say that, step into the light. Step into the light means that you must operate off of an assumption that the scripture that says to arise because the glory of the Lord, the light has come, God is doing God's part in ensuring that there is light close enough to us to take a decision or a step into the light. Meaning that even if I may find myself in a dark place, I may find the will, the decision, the practices to take a step into the light. I've often told some of the young people, young men I've worked with, that we often assume that the first step towards transformation is a physical one. But I have found that the first revolution is always an internal one. What I decide to do on the inside is usually what gets manifested on the outside. If I do soul work, 
everything else will change. But if I only do work on the outside, you can look good on the outside and your inside still be rotten to the core. The power of the work of God's spirit is that God loves to work from the inside out. I don't know about you, but I'm glad about that. I mean, I love for God to work on the outside in sometimes. So then, you know, probably wouldn't have to work as hard as the gym or, you know, just, you know, God just, just turn it all around. But how many of you know that there is work on our insides? The part of you that you can't put in a science lab. The part of you that you can't measure. The part of you that you can't handle with your hands. God wants to do some work on your insides. And if we tell the truth, that's the hardest place for God to work. Because I like my insides the way they are. Can I get a witness up in here? How many of you like the way you are? Just keep it real. I like the way I am. I mean, you know, hey, I, you know, I, I, like, I like knowing that this is my line. You push my line, then we're going to have some problems. And God's like, no, you got to move your line six inches. To, no, no, wait, God. Come on now. My line being this, this way got me to this point. This has been my defense mechanism. This has been how I've survived up until this point. The way I've been internally constituted. God, why are you trying to mess with a good thing? <laughs> you ever told God that? i told that a lot of times. God, listen, just leave me bride alone. I, I've had enough. All this change. <laughs> but I found the more I prayed, the more God changed me. The more I went to therapy, good therapy. Therapy with someone who can tell me the truth, but also give me some solutions. The soul work, the, inter the more all of that changed, the less violent I became. The less mean-spirited I became. The less paranoid I became. Because I decided to take a step out of the gloom and into the light. And I got to tell you, when I take steps into the light, when you take steps into the light, it does not guarantee you that the gloom leaves. It just means that you operate differently in the circumstances in which we live. Woo. How I many you know 2024 is a year for some of us to step into the light? I hope that all the work we do, all the transformation work that happens in us, I hope it changes the world. I hope we never have to fight another war anywhere in the world. I hope we eliminate poverty. I hope we eliminate racism. I hope we eliminate the violence among young people. I hope we eliminate uh, the tragedies in our family. I hope we eliminate all of it. I hope we cure cancer. I hope we cure HIV AIDS. I, I hope we get rid of all of it. And until then, God has to change some internal things in me. So until the change comes, I can still function in the light. Ooh, somebody throw your hands and say, God, help me to function in the light. Help me to function in the light. The, 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 the second thing that the scripture says that I think is important is that the gloom or the darkness covers earth. I like to, I like to replace Every time I read the word darkness in scripture, I like to replace it with gloom. Only because, you know, darkness often is overly associated with blackness. And there ain't no problem with the melanin in your skin. So I don't want you to think like, you know, psychologically the scripture don't ever affirm your melanin. No, melanin is beautiful at every gradation. So the translators could and perhaps if I were me, should use gloom to denote that what the writer is telling the children of Israel is that if you're not careful, gloom 
fogginess will obstruct your ability to see the light, to find the warmth, to access the energy. And we're seeing it in real time. Yesterday was January 6th, the third year anniversary of the insurrection on the U.S. Capitol. And they resurrected some old clips. And it was just a fascinating reminder to me of how very few people have the self-awareness to acknowledge when you are being deceived. And, you know, they, you know, obviously was on display for everybody to see. I mean, you've seen cats scaling. Some of y'all never been to the Capitol. I want you to know, th these walls, they were scaling. <laughs> 30 feet walls. And I was trying to think to myself, I'm not trying to body shame anybody, but I've seen these obviously out of shape men uh, hanging upside down, trying to <laughs> climb up the wall, roping the wall. You know, they, you know, they ain't been no special forces training. These just some everyday dudes. <laughs> one, one lady got sprayed with tear gas and she's crying. They're interviewing her. What happened? Oh, uh, uh, they sprayed me with tear gas. What's your name? Stephanie. And why are you here? It's a revolution. I was just trying to go into the Capitol and overthrow them because she just saying all this and she was so sincere. <laughs> I was thinking to myself, you really thought, you, Stephanie, <laughs> you thought you was going to come to the capital of the United States of America. You don't got no gun, you don't got no body armor, you got your little scarf that you bought from Target, I guess, on the way, and you gonna, you, gonna, you, Stephanie, is gonna overthrow the government. <laughs> I was looking at that, I said, man, Stephanie was deceived. Oh, I was so tickled like we tickled today. I just like, Lord, I'm glad I'm not like Stephanie. <laughs> Except when I am. <laughs> Can you think of all the times you've been deceived and you did not know you were being deceived? You thought people trying to tell you, don't you go up to that Capitol. There's somebody waiting for you there that you ain't going to, they, they going to give you some energy you ain't ready for. No, it's a revolution. Who told her it was a revolution? We think it was Donald Trump. That's why he should not be eligible to run for president again. That's what many of us think. But, you know, some people just want to see the United States of America just fall apart. You know, I'm not saying I'm, you know, this pro-patriotic person. But I do realize if the United States of America falls apart too bad, too fast, it's going to fall on our heads first. <laughs> so some of us who like super revolutionary, I just want you to be re reminded that there are a lot of vulnerable people who are dependent on some semblance of a functional society. Wow the revolution happens. This is a little nugget for you. But gloom, deception, lies. How many other people, unfortunately, in your life who know how to lay some gloom on you, deceive you, cause you to believe a lie. And you often need to step outside of the gloom, their gloom, and you need somebody to give you <laughs> some light, some heat, 
and some energy so you don't stay deceived by the gloom. Brothers, there's a lot of gloom out here. You want to keep us far from God, keep us far from ourselves, keep us far from our families, keep us far from our communities. Some of us got to step outside and into the light. Someone check on that for me. Family, there's a lot of gloom that would love to keep us deceived and paralyzed. But I want you to know, beloved, that we don't have to stay in gloomy places. How many believe that today? 2024 ought to be a place where you commit to not staying in gloomy places. You ought to resist gloom, resist deceptions, and be honest with yourself. This is my last point of this, and then I'm, 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 we're going to end. That you likely need community, good community, to help you understand the deceptions at work in your life. If you are too isolated, you can actually betray your own good intentions. That's why it's good to go talk to a therapist or get in a process group or find you some folk that you can talk plainly to. You shouldn't tell everybody everything. Find you some folk you can trust. Three or four people you can sit around the lake, watch a game with, grab a bite, coffee, and run some ideas about it. Hey, you know, I was thinking of going up to the Capitol to help be a part of the <laughs> revolution. <laughs> And if they tell you don't go, <laughs> I hope you listen to them. If they tell you don't go up there, you, 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 you're not built for that. I hope in 2024, you find godly, good, wise community that helps you resist the gloom and deceptions. Amen. 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 The scripture ends by saying this, the glory of the Lord will appear over you. The presence of God will appear. The dope thing about the sun is when it shines on Certain surfaces, it reflects at the same angle the sun hits. God's glory on God's people should be reflecting and appearing wherever we are. When we step outside of the gloom, outside of the deceptions, outside of the places that are trying to obstruct the light, trying to steal our warmth, trying to uh, block our energy, when we step outside and allow the sun to hit us, it reflects well in every situation we're in. I love how Dr. King in The Transformed Nonconformist he said that there are two types of people in the world. There are people who are thermometers and thermostats. Said, if you're a thermometer, when you come into a room, you are measuring or reflecting the existing conditions in that room. If it's cold, the mercury in the thermometer will drop. If it's warm, the mercury and the thermometer will rise. But if you are a thermostat, you control the conditions in the room. If it gets too cold, <laughs> come hit the button, get it up to the cool Bay Area, 70 degrees. Somebody say amen. amen. If it's too hot, 80 degrees, 90 degrees, what? No, 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 no. You're going to turn it on down, get it back to the good old Bay Area, 70 degrees. <laughs> so I say, man, 
We are created. You, pat yourself on the chest, say me, are created to be a thermostat. Why? Because the glory of the Lord is literally bouncing off you. Everywhere I go, I got the glory. And I walk into a room, oh, it's a little haterism in this room. Mm -hmm. I'm a bastion of love. Oh, it's a little violence in this room. I'm a bastion of peace. Oh, it's a little confusion. Mm -hmm. I, I bring some unity. Now you walking into the room, and if it's a hater, oh, I'm a hater today. <laughs> If it's a, it's, a, it's a war, oh yeah, I'm a, I'm a soldier, I'm a, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a, no, no. God needs you to be a thermostat Amen. in 2024. God needs us in our families, in our schools, in our communities, in our politics, in our relationships, in your own journey. Be a thermostat. Amen. Be outside. And let the glory of the Lord shine Amen. on you, on everything around you. Be outside. Stand to your feet, everybody. Let's prepare ourselves to pray. Can you help me bring this cross? Last week, we... Thank you, Deke. Last week, we had this cross as an expression of our collective commitment in 2024. Some of us felt like 2023, there's some things that we needed to leave behind. In 2024, there's some things we wanted to literally come into the new year and do. And so we're going to keep bringing this out a few times during the consecration. So if you are here today and you weren't able to participate in this practice. This is almost like our altar for 2024 hopes, dreams, aspirations for the year I want, the year I need. We're going into consecration. We're going to be praying over every single item that we place on this cross. Whether you're here in person with us or not, we're going to call these requests out. And by faith, believe that as a community, God knows how to answer our prayers. By solidarity and mutual commitment to each other. You may not be able to be here in prayer, but somebody's going to be praying for you. One week, they may not be able to be here, but then you'll be praying for them. We're going to invite us to keep thinking about God, how can I and how can we? be together in 2024 in a way that causes us to step into the light.